Thank you, Frank. Yeah, um, I'm just going to take a couple minutes here. Worship the Lord in holy attire. In holy attire. Tremble before him, all the earth. And jump down here. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Wow, what a great week I had. Um, did you ever get in a slump? We all have, yeah, of course. We all get in a slump. I think I got in one a couple weeks ago, you know. And I, I don't know, I was, I, maybe a month ago, I was, I was plowing, then my back started hurting, and then well, you hear all this COVID stuff, and then you listen to TV, and then even worse, you get on the internet. I think that's why I gave my computer to Maureen. And um, you, you listen to all this stuff, and, and then about a couple of weeks ago, I had this terrible, I went to the emergency, been in the emergency room twice. Anyway, to, to, to move along here, um, I think I got into a bit of a slump, too. And was I in medicine? Oh, yes. Did you know what the best antidote for that is? Right here. And sometimes, and, and just to, to chime off a little bit of what Jesse said last week, That stayed with me all week. And also what happened Tuesday night here stayed with me all week too. And um, sometimes, sometimes God will allow us. Sometimes he will actually put us in a little bit of a slump. And drag us back. Hold on. And like what Frank said, you know, Frank, Frank said the same thing, too, you know. Um, yeah, you know, the election didn't turn out the way I wanted it to and all that stuff and uh, this and all that. Press on, people. Press on. Pastor, I'm going to say it again. That was that was that 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 message last week moved me, and that probably did more good for me than all the moxicillin I could take. I don't know. Darla remembers what it was with some big horse pill to clean my infection up in my ear. That message did more for me to press on. We are to press on and move on. God wants us to, to, to get okay. We, we got all this stuff going on, the COVID, and uh, you know, all of you have had different illnesses, people. He's back was killing him. I know, I was over there. He, he, he. But you know, Keith is pressed on, he's here today. I miss church. I'll tell you. I'll tell you, people. I miss church. I missed it. But I also said, you know, eh, hey, I got an earache. I'm going to stay home for a while. You know, I miss you, people. And we need each other. Why are we here? Why are each one of us here? We need, we need Evelyn Brown. We need Roxy. We need Amy Sable. We need John Elshon. Every one of you, Dan, every one of us. And that's how you press on. You press on because we're here. God put us here to help one another. So I said, 
you know, at home Tuesday and it was kind of a lousy evening. It was raining. And I come on here and I says, well, I made it, I'm here. We had a great Bible study. But we did something after the study. It did more building. It's that glue. God's love. To God's tenderness. To meet each and every person here. And we broke up into groups. And the children got together and came up here, and the women came over here, and the men came all the way back there. And we went around, and we told each other just how much we need each other. That did more for me than, I'll admit it, that probably any preacher could to hear that. Gee. John Elshemer, he must really like me. Jesse, he must have really been like me. And, and not that we're wanting that to gloat over it, but I, I just want to say, press on. Got an acre. Go to the Lord in prayer. Lord and Father, we thank you so much here that you give us your word, your word. And the Holy Spirit is within us that we can press on. Because without that and without you and without God, your son, Jesus, and without the Holy Spirit, we would never be able to. That is quite evident today as we look around the world, we look around the country today that is in much turmoil. But we're not to look at them. We're to look at you, Lord. And may our focus be on you. Now that we're into December, as we talked about as Eva talked about in the Bible study, may the focus be on Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and not of the presence, and not of what we're going to get, but of the true meaning of Christmas. That we are saved, we are born again, not of anything we've done, but what your son has done on the cross. That we'll have eternal life and have it more abundantly. And while we wait for that, may we be the servants here that you would want us. May we encourage other people to press on. May we call our neighbor, our friend this week, that we haven't talked to maybe in a while. Take them something, gifts, encouragement. Sometimes we just need encouragement. Sometimes we just need to hear, you matter. You matter to me. And sometimes that's all we just need. Except for some people, that could be the best Christmas present they could hear. More than any gift, more than any card, more than any money. You matter to me. You matter to me. I love you. Lord, we think of the people here that have been sick, illness, injury. May you make them well. May you give them encouragement and people that have had loss. 
that you matter. We thank you so much for this body of believers. And may we leave here today and may we go out. And may we encourage this entire community of Interlaken to press on and to lead them to the Lord, to where all truth comes from, all righteousness, all truth. None of your TV, none of your paper, not of anything, but from your word. May we be a lighthouse here. And we thank you so much. And now as Pastor Jesse gets ready to preach, we thank you so much for him, for the abundance he has, for his dedication, for his knowledge of you, Lord. And we bless each and every one here today. In Jesus' name. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I pray that you may see our love overflow still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that we may discover the things that are excellent, that we may be sincere and blameless for the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes only through Jesus Christ, for you are so worthy of glory and praise. Amen. I would ask that you turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Philippians. The real thrust of my message this morning is to build on what was talked about last week. Last week, uh, we were talking about pressing on, and this week, we're talking about standing firm. So last week was... Press on this week is stand firm. And we see Paul's command to the church in this way in chapter 4 and verse 1. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. And I want to begin by asking you just a very simple question for you to munch on, to chew on as we're going through Scripture this morning. What is so pressing in the lives of Christians that would make Paul enforce or really reinforce the need to stand firm. Because it's not only to the Philippians that he is writing, he is writing even to us this morning. Every church that has ever existed in all time has this battle in front of them, the battle of staying firm. Yes, every church is different. And yes, every church has their own individual trials. There may be different reasons for giving up or feeling like you want to give up, but every church must stand firm. So what is it? What is so pressing in the lives of Christians? What is so pressing in the lives of us today that would make Paul reinforce even to you this morning that this is your charge to hear? Where do you need to stand firm in your walk with the Lord? Well, as I said, as you're chewing that, I want to share my second goal with you this morning, and I'm not going to apologize for it. I'm going to show you line by line through Scripture many of the places that the New Testament makes it clear that this command should be part of your life. Uh, The goal is not to just say in some sort of passing way, stand firm. No worries. Just wait it out. Let's move on but rather the message of the Bible consistently aims at reinforcing our minds and perhaps more importantly, our hearts, how vitally important this message is of standing firm in all of Scripture. And let me just show you this by taking you to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So go to the left about 20 pages, 1 Corinthians 
chapter 15, to the church in Corinth, Paul writes in verse 58, in the midst of what their struggles were, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be firm, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Flip the page and look at chapter 16 and verse 13. Chapter 16, verse 13 says, Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Flip, if you will, four more books over to the right to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Paul here is writing to the church in Colossae uh, in regards to their struggles. And he writes this in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Flip to the next book, the book of 1 Thessalonians. It probably is one page away to the right. Here, Paul again writes to the Thessalonica church in chapter 3 and verse 8. Chapter 3 and verse 8. Paul says this, For now we really live if you, what? Stand firm in the Lord. Flip another page to 2 Thessalonians. Paul again is writing a second letter to the same church. He reminds this church in chapter 2 and verse 15, so then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold on to the traditions that you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. But this is not just two churches that Paul writes these commands to. Uh, the book To Your Right in, in, in 1 Timothy, we have a letter that's written by Paul to one of his pastoral students with a very similar language to stand firm. If you're right there, look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. And look what he says to his student of the word. Verse 12 of chapter 6, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you have called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. He is charging Timothy to fight for it, to stand firm, to hold your position in the faith. And it may be a strange thing to think about, maybe for you, not, not for me, for sure, but even while in the ministry, even a, even a pastor, even a, a missionary will continually to be under forces that just continually say to him, give up, walk away. Your faith is useless. This job is too hard for you. Flip to 2 Timothy. Um, if you flip past 2 Timothy and go past Titus and go past, past Philemon, again, it's just a few pages. And we get to the book of Hebrews, and there's some debate as to who wrote Hebrews. Some believe Paul. But again, look at his language in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if we keep the beginning of our commitment firm until the end. Again, just a few more pages. Hebrews 10, verse 23. Hebrews 10, verse 23. Let's hold firmly to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Flip a couple more pages to the right to the book of James. And perhaps you're at this point thinking, okay, Jesse, uh, I got it. <laughs> we need to hold firm. We need to steadfast and and listen, the point of flipping through all of these verses uh, that the Bible has to offer about standing firm or what the Bible has to say about being steadfast in your faith, the, the point is that over and over and over and over and over again, we see in Scripture that this is a major theme of the Bible. You, you cannot read the Scriptures and say to yourself, it's not important to stand firm, or there's not a battle to stand firm. It is literally in every book of the Bible. You need to stand firm 
for your faith and in your faith. And I don't know about you, but when I say something over and over and over and over and over to my children, it's because it's really important. I need you to understand this. This is really important. And it's uh, not this not just this way, not just this importance for the life of Paul, but more Christian leaders are stepping out and saying, hey, this is important, and this is what you need to understand. And, and in this example, we'll see it from the life of James. James was a pillar in the community of the, the Palestine community. Uh, he was the so-called co-chair of the Jerusalem Council, found in Acts chapter 15, 13 through 21. And Paul even visited James and took advice from James uh, and his final visit to Jerusalem. We see that in Acts 21 and verse 18. And listen in to the advice of James here in chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. It says, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. He goes on in verse 12, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord promised to those who love him. And I am sure that everyone is groaning right now as we read those beginning parts of James. And, and why, why do we groan with scriptures like that that say, have joy in your trials? Well, well simply because we do not want to take joy in our trials, right? I mean, we associate joy with Christmas. We associate joy with glad tidings. We, we associate joy with good feelings. We feel joy. Uh, when people are excited and happy. We associate joy with prosperity. We associate joy with uh, life and health, and when life is easy, when everybody is alive and healthy. Uh, but there is a side of joy that, has, that goes so much deeper than just those things. There is a side, there's a side of joy that runs so deep in the corridors of the human soul that enable one to endure the hardest possible tasks of this life, that help people to deal with the hardest issues of life, to help clean up the stinkiest, most putrid, most ungodly parts of human existence. There's parts of joy that help enable us to take on violence and harsh criticisms. There's parts of joy that can make uh, their way, help us make our way through deep valleys where souls die year after year, and still a person of faith and hope can come out the other side of those things, not betraying or losing their joy. Those things are real. Those things are part of our faith. Those things are things that we should be able to experience in our life with Jesus Christ. And you may be thinking, well, Jess, that all sounds well and good, but I need a real example of that. Give me, give me a life that, that made it through things like that. Well, just look one page back in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 12 and look at verses 1 through 3. It says, Therefore, since we have also have seen a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let's run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary, and so that you will not lose heart. You must stay focused on the example of Jesus Christ. Consider him, consider Jesus, consider fixing your eyes on him every moment of your life. He knows what you're dealing with. He has been there. He has made it to the other side of those things. And he gives us this charge, consider my life so that you will not grow weary and so you will not lose heart. Those who have very successful spiritual lives are losing themselves in the image 
of Christ. As Paul would say, it is no longer I that live, but it is Christ living in me. And really, I can just picture Paul just trying to live his life as Christ would live his life, literally embracing the image of Christ as his image and trying to live that out in the best way he possibly can. That should be our joy. Make no mistake, family, evil surrounds us and and evil wants to sabotage your faith it's the goal of evil to see you cower in the corner it's the goal of evil to pull you away from the god of the universe to make you wave the white flag and surrender your joy that is that is how they celebrate consider the lost joy of adam and eve or, or Cain, you remember when Scripture talks about Cain, it said that evil was crouching at his door. That, that's how close our spiritual warfare really is. And it would be good to remember things like that. Any student of the Bible, any person who reads this book from cover to cover will see that it says over and over and over and over and over again, stand firm, family. Stand firm in your faith. Whatever trial you're under, You can be assured you are not alone. You are not the first to experience trials, and you will not be the last. Every generation of Christians has struggled through this life. If you're still in Hebrews or James, then turn a page to the right to 1 Peter chapter 5. Again, it's just a few pages. 1 Peter chapter 5, the apostle Paul excuse me, the apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5, beginning in verse 6, these words, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, having cast all your anxiety on him, because what? He cares for you. Be of a sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So resist them, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brothers and sisters who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, I love this, will himself perfect, uh, confirm, strengthen and establish you to him be the dominion forever and ever amen what i love about this scripture is verse 10 if you will choose to obey scripture if you will choose to stand firm for the faith then christ himself comes to your aid christ himself will perfect you christ himself will confirm you christ himself will strengthen you and christ himself will establish you establish you for all of eternity. That is his joy. And you are perhaps nowhere closer to Christ than than in your times of suffering. Right? You You may be no closer to Christ than right now during the day and age that we live in. So the message of the Bible is clear through many witnesses that as Christians, faithful to the Lord in so many areas of our life, we must never neglect the command to stand firm or to fail to be faithful to it. Remember, Christ is asking you to stand firm, and he doesn't say that without backing you up. He's not sending you to the front line so that he can escape. He is behind you. He is all around you. He is the He has the power to see you succeed. And all you need to do is stand firm in him. Have enough faith right now to stand firm in him. I don't, I want to prolong our time just a little bit more uh, to give you some practical reminders on how to stand firm. And I'm going to take these right from Philippians. So go back to Philippians with me. And there are perhaps many here to choose from. And today I just offer three identifiable strategies, if you will, that will teach us how to stand firm. So Philippians chapter 1, again, we we were there before, and it's appropriate for us to, again, keep going back. For me, Philippians is one of those 
books that's like Thanksgiving dinner. Like you pour gravy on one thing and it just launches into everything else or the cranberry jelly, you put it on your plate and all of a sudden everything tastes like cranberry jelly. Philippians is that kind of book. I don't think you can just read it straight through. It's just, it just circulates and circulates and percolates and percolates until it is, it is given you the most enjoyable meal you've ever had in your life. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, it says, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. That is our first strategy. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Simply st- said that if you start discharging worldly attitudes in your fight to stand firm, then you are deceiving yourself that you are indeed standing for Christ. Employing the methods of the devil will only invite the devil closer. And I guarantee you, he will sink your ship a lot faster. That is not what you're called to, to look like the devil. You are called to live your life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your conduct needs to be a reflection of Christ. That is where you find your victory. Pick any battlefield listed in Scripture. Any time in the Old Testament that you, are, that you want to go to, any time a leader or a nation disregarded the Lord and how to win, they failed. A lot of times they failed miserably. They buried fathers. They buried sons for their lack of attention given to the Lord. It's not just about us defending ourselves. It's also about making every battle an opportunity to bring more praise and more glory to God. Therefore, he needs to be a very integral part of every struggle and every battle we face in this life. Our second strategy is in chapter 1, again, verse 27 and 28. So that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. What is Paul suggesting here? Simply that Christian living is both individual. You have, to, you have to claim it for yourself. And yet Christianity is also a very corporate experience. It is both very personal and it is very relational. Those two things work together in the most beautiful, beautiful way. And so church, as Dick has said, as other people have said this morning, we need each other. We need each other. The church is here for you, to help you, to encourage you to get through the tough times. If any Christian makes rationales to move away from the fellowship of a church, really the body of Christ that Christ has knit together, maybe specifically for this time, people who walk away from the body, they have been tricked by a very sinister and sinful, idealistic idea from the devil that will ultimately come to their destruction. It is the devil who wants to self-isolate you, not the Lord. There are times when we need to find solitude with the Lord, and we have those special moments of presence with him, but generically speaking, across the board, Christ is not someone who isolates you. Christ is someone who puts you in a family. Right from the beginning when he created Adam, what did he say? It is not good for man to be alone. It's not good for us to be alone either. For that reason, Christ gave us a church to stand with each other and stand for Christ in a very corporate way. A church has been made by Christ for that reason, to strive together. That's the second strategy. The third strategy, we see this in chapter 2, verses 3 through 5 which says, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. What is he saying here? Take a dose of humility. Better yet, take two doses of humility. (laughs) It, It does us all good. God has put people in your life for a reason. And you would be wise to listen to their opinions. You would be wise to listen to the experiences of their life for they have walked through dark times with the Lord and they can really help you 
through those issues of life. Christians who don't stand firm think they have it all together. <laughs> they don't. They don't know everything. They may think they know everything. They don't know everything. Sometimes they may think that people around them just don't get it, if you will, basically calling them idiots. That, that's terrible. It's terrible. Have that kind of thinking that people just don't understand you it means that you're really struggling with pride. And, and maybe the best case scenario is that maybe you're just struggling to think that people can't relate to you. I, I, would get, I would encourage you to avoid that and choose humility. Some of the best counsel I have ever gotten came out of a child. So let me, as we close, let me just say the obvious. Standing firm is not an easy, is not an easy command to obey, amen? But I know that we all need to be. Whenever you feel the urge to give up, the urge to self-isolate, I would encourage you to take one of these strategies and apply it. Call a friend. Ask him for help. And if you will, like we did on Tuesday, ask directly for encouragement. Ask directly for it. I need encouragement today, Frank. I need it. A little bit of humility, guys, it goes so far. It may be possible that someone this morning is listening to this message today that needs to change their tune. Change their tune. And uh, to that point, you know, I just want to flash back to Psalms 96 because verse, four, verse 1 says, Sing to the Lord a new song. A new song. If, if you need to change your tune, do it today. Give the Lord a new song. Change your mind about your present trials. Give them to the Lord and focus on praising him instead of murmuring, instead of complaining to him. Give him your praise for standing with you because he loves you that much. Secondly, verse 9 says, Worship the Lord in holy attire. And I love the fact that, Dick, you picked up on this this morning. Um, listen, God, God gave you his holiness That should boggle our mind, that he gave us his holiness. He paid the price for our sin. The reality is, is we don't wear it well. We don't wear it well. We need to lose ourselves in his holiness. The pictures in my mind are of a happy little child who finds one of dad's shirts and the sleeves are too big, and the shirts are, you know, down to his ankles, and he is just enjoying himself in a shirt that is too big for him to wear. That's the picture I have about what it's like to wear his holiness. It is way too big for us to possibly comprehend. But we can take pleasure in wearing his holiness and being lost in the shirt of it on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm encouraging this morning to lose your identity into Christ's. And I believe in doing so, you will stand firm. You will stand firm. So let's close in prayer. Father God, I do thank you for your word this morning and for its impact on our lives. Father, I pray that every member of this church would lose themselves in their relationship with you. That they would be transformed by you, yes, but they would be just lost in how good you are. So lost that that is all they can talk about. They just want to praise you and praise you and praise you and praise you for the life-changing work that you did in our life. Father, we thank you and we glorify you, especially in this Advent season when you have come to the earth to embody flesh on our behalf. Father, thank you. 
Thank you for that precious gift. And thank you for changing our lives in such remarkable ways. We give this time to you and we thank you for it. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I do want to sing that last song and then we'll just be dismissed, okay?